You can't buy his miracle. And that's what Elijah is trying to teach him, this principle. But how many people know sometimes with people that are new believers, it's almost like you have to teach them a whole new way of living, a whole new way of thinking. And it's not because they're bad people, because here, hey, Naaman's heart is right, right? He's acknowledging this. He's acknowledging it, but he's having trouble with it. And he's having a misunderstanding. He doesn't understand. All God wants is your heart and obedience. He wants you to be faithful, right? You want to thank God for saving you? Go out there and minister to people. Go out there and share your faith with people. Fight through all the fears that you may have. He doesn't just want you to sit down and listen to me. I heard someone say amen. (laughs) But he wants you to thank him by obeying him, by being a witness, by going out there and sharing your faith, by telling someone about Jesus, by showing them that your life has been changed. And a lot of times, even Christians don't understand that. How do you thank God? Do you show your neighbor when they're passing the tray? You kind of tilt your check to kind of like show them how big it is? God doesn't care about that. The church does, but God doesn't care about that. Right? So there's misunderstanding. So we just kind of start off with that kind of idea, right? Second thing is... is uh, What comes with the double anointing and just an anointing in general is a messy ministry. We don't think about ministry as being messy, but let me tell you what, it is messy sometimes because you're dealing with people. You're dealing with people that are insecure sometimes. You're dealing with people that don't particularly, they don't have the same kind of a connection with you maybe than somebody else. Or how many people know that God brings different people to the church sometimes? And they're different, right? They're different, right? Some are waving flags and, 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 and some are like just basically playing instruments that you think, man, they should be playing those instruments, worshiping in a way that you think, man, this isn't like what I'm used to. And everybody, every Christian thinks, I know the way. This is the right way of doing it. And that's what's so hard about trying to lead a church is when God brings in different people, right? Because churches need different people to use their different gifts and their different abilities. We need different people. We need it. Well, that person, you know, she's a little bit or he's a little bit more more charismatic than I like, right? We need those people. We need them. Because otherwise, we'll just be boring people that just go to church and, we, and, and sit down on the pew and say, I'll see you next Sunday. Like, I want people to be excited, right? You should come to church with an expectation, right? We're like, oh, God, i got to get up again. And, oh, my hair isn't right. You know, I don't know. Where's the hairspray? I need the hairspray. It's, it's not working right today. Oh, you know what? I'm just going to put a hat on. I mean, we have all this, like, reasons why we struggle when we go to church, you know? Oh, the pastor's boring. His sermons are so long. And it's like, God, you know, I got to go to lunch. And in and out calling my name. It's like we are messy. It's, It's hard to run a ministry because we have different people. And then there are some people that are like, hey, this person needs to be quiet because I want to listen here. Or, you know, I don't want them to raise their hand, you know? God has made us all different because he wants variety. And I think with variety, when we get variety, then all of a sudden God starts putting in people's hearts how they can minister to people. And, and we just we have to get along with people. We have to get along with people. But sometimes ministry is messy. And sometimes the situations that you're dealt with is not easy to solve through. I'm going to show you an example right now. This is not an easy thing. This is Naaman, right? Because Naaman is struggling from guilt here. And so it says, then Naaman said, okay, if you won't accept money, right? 
He said, if not, please let there be given to your servant two mule and loads of earth. For from now on, your servant will not offer burnt offerings or sacrifice to any god but the Lord, right? So Naaman is like, okay, I want your dirt. I want your dirt because he wants to build an altar, right? And he, he completely continues to say, I'm only worshiping your God because your God is true. Your God is the right God. And that's great, right? But again, when you're ministering to people who are new believers, they come from diverse backgrounds, and Naaman is no exception here. It says... In this matter, may the Lord pardon your servant. For what? Why does he need pardoning? He says, when my master, who his master is the king of Syria, Ben-Hadid, uh, Ramon, when he, my master goes into the house of Ramon to worship there, leaning on my arm, and I bow myself in the house of Ramon, when I bow myself in the house of Ramon, the Lord pardon your servant in this matter. Now, that's messy, amen? That's messy, right? Because most of us are like, has he not read the first two commandments? There should be no other God before me and there be no idols, right? And so basically what's happening here is Nahum is looking for a pardon because in a way, he's stuck. He's not from Israel. He didn't know the Ten Commandments. He doesn't know what the law is. The only thing that he knows is that God has healed him of his leprosy. And in response to that, his gratitude is, you are the only God in the earth you are the only one that I will sacrifice and give offerings to. Can I even get some dirt here so that I can build an altar there just to show everybody that walks around that I can tell this person I am sacrificing to the God of Israel. But it's messy. It's messy. And then in verse 19, Elijah doesn't really uh, make it any clear. He said to him, Go in peace. And, and so we're here reading this story, and we're thinking a couple things. Number one, go in peace means go ahead and go into the temple with, with, with your... Uh, people used to think this, this, this king was disabled because it talks about him leaning on his arm. But it's also an expression of someone who is an advisor to the king that they lean on the arm. So there's a debate there. doesn't tell us what the answer is, right? But it sounds better if you know that he's leaning, right? Because if he's leaning on if he's handicapped there, when he has to bend down, the guy's holding him up. And so maybe that's why he's saying, hey, I got to hold him up. We don't know. But he was part of the Syrian army. He was a commander. This was a national kind of religion that they did in Syria. And the god of Hadad Rahman was known as either, depending on which commentary, the sun god or the god of thunder. Whatever it is, he had to do with weather, okay? And so this is a predicament. And people are like, going back and forth. Oh, he wasn't really a believer. He's just kind of faking it. Oh, there's no way he should go. Elisha needs to tell him. The right thing for Elisha to tell him is that you can't do that. But sometimes the ministry is messy. It's murky. It's not clear, especially for somebody who is from a different background a different context. And the interesting thing about this is the Bible does not condemn or condone in this story. He's never described as one that was disobeying God. If anything, Naaman was described as a person that was a man of valor, 
that really took care of his, uh, his, his master. He was known for that because if the king was crippled and Naaman had leprosy, they probably had this real close connection. But we don't know, so we... And, and that happens in ministry sometimes. It's just so messy. You have people that are missionaries on the field sometimes. They're, mission, they're, they're, they're like in Africa or some other region, and they are people that have, been, have multiple wives. They're married to, and then they become saved, and they go to the church, and it's like they're sitting in the front row, this guy with his three wives. And the Christians are back there saying, well, you're only supposed to have one wife. So what should we do? What should we do with this person? Well, he needs to get rid of that person. He needs to get rid of two of those wives at least. It's a complicated situation because of a different background. And so some missionaries in churches like that say, okay, well, they're welcome to attend, but they're not going to get involved like with leadership and so forth. But the interesting thing is the story that I read about this particular person, he actually went up to the leadership and concluded, hey, you know, I just realized something. I can't have three wives. And he took care of it in his time. But that's the thing here, in his time, because sometimes even though you know this is right, it's not the right time. I mean, think about, think about for example, Naaman. Right now, he represents the only witness of the God of Israel in his country. Right now, he bears the fruit of the miracle that he had accomplished with him. And they're obviously going to look at him and know that he's been healed. And they're going to ask questions about how he's been healed. And maybe later on, maybe later on, Naaman says, you know what? I love you, king, but I can't continue to go here and worship in that home. We don't know the story, but we know what our opinions are. But sometimes ministry gets messy. A lot of, a lot of things have been happening um, uh, with Andy Stanley's church in Atlanta because they have this conference every year called the uh, Parent Connect. And I've seen people on YouTube uh, just telling him to publicly repent and confess of his wrongdoing. And <laughs> there's one. And the thing is, is that Andy Stanley would say, if you watched a church service, he had tells people what's going on. And he, Stanley would say, I'm just trying to have a conversation. Right now we have opinions, but we don't have conversations that whatever he says, we have to learn how to have conversations, otherwise we're going to lose the next generation. And so you got people that are like, okay, he's wrong. Oh, no, I understand what he's doing. And that's what leaders in ministry have to face all the time. And they have to go before the Lord, and they have to say, God, help me, because this is not an easy decision. And so, ministry gets messy sometimes. When you try to win people to Christ that aren't from a church background. You're dealing with people that may have struggled with pornography or dealing with people that maybe struggle with addiction. Um, you're dealing with people that have a, a new philosophy or they focus on doing what they want to do. They're not used to focusing on what God wants them to do. I remember when I came to Christ, you know, in my 20s, I remember, I'm like, man, I have to think completely different because I'm not used to doing that. I'm used to doing what Kenny wants, not what God wants. And sometimes when we don't know, if we don't know someone personally, instead of like maybe 
talking about them to others, maybe it's a good idea just to ask them, hey, you know what, tell me what your, your belief is or your philosophy is. Because I really want to understand this. You know, the devil, like, really brings disunity to the church when the church is involved in conversations about other people that they don't really know. And it happens all the time because ministry gets messy. And it's really about to get messy as we continue this whole story here. Uh, The double anointing sometimes comes with undermining authority. I'll show you what it means. Now, when Naaman had gone from, the cha- from, from him a short distance, uh, Gehazi, the servant of Elisha, the man of God, so this is the guy that actually is the head servant that probably is the person like, like Elisha was with Elijah, probably is the one that they're thinking, you're going to be the next person to hold the mantle. And so Gehazi, Gehazi, the servant of Elisha, the man of God, said, See, my master has spared Naaman uh, this Syrian in not accepting from his hand what he brought. And now Naaman makes a proclamation. Can you believe this? This is a proclamation. This is almost like a vow. He's like, As the Lord lives, I will run after him and get something from him. And isn't that wild? As the Lord lives, I will get something. So what's happening here? Elisha is being undermined. He's being undermined. Um, and, And the question is, to what extent will he continue to be undermined? So it says, so Gehazi followed Naaman. And when Naaman saw someone running after him, he got down from the chariot to meet him and said, is all well, right? Is all well. So how is Gehazi going to respond to this? Well, glad you asked. He said, all is well. But then he lies. He says, my master has sent me to say, there have now come to me from the hill country of Ephraim, Two young men and sons of the prophets. Please give them a talent of silver and two changes of clothing. One of the hard things about leadership, for those of you that have been involved in leadership, uh, sometimes your authority can be undermined. You know, sometimes it can be undermined. And it's like Elisha made a declarative vow to the Lord. As long as the Lord lives and in whom I stand, I will not receive any of your money. And so what's happening now is that Elisha's name has potential to get smeared because he just said completely the opposite. But sometimes the greed that people have, the selfishness that people have, dictate them to lie. And Naaman said, be pleased to accept two talents. And he urged him and he tied up two talents of silver in two bags with two changes of clothing and laid them on two of his servants, and they carried him before Gehazi, right? So Naaman wants to give. He's thinking, Elisha's changed his mind, and he's, he's thrilled about it. He's happy about it. He wants to help people. But Gehazi misrepresented him for his own selfish greed. And unfortunately for Gehazi, The double anointing and God's judgment. One of the things I find interesting about Elisha is he didn't tell, he didn't tell, gosh, I keep getting the name wrong. He didn't tell his servant, hey, you lied. You're going to see this. He doesn't tell him that he lied. 
he doesn't tell them, let's go back. Let's go back to Naaman and tell him the truth. So as I'm reading this, this is what I was just, I was just pondering this, right? It says, and when he came to the hill, he took from them their hand and put them in the house, and he set the men away, and they departed. And he went in, and he stood before his master, and Elisha said to him, where have you been, Gehazi? And he said, what? Your servant went nowhere. You know, when you start lying about people that are in authority over you, it's hard to stop. Sir Walter, Walter Raleigh once said, we would a wet, tangled web we weave when at first we practice to deceive. But Elisha said to him, did not my heart go when the man turned from his chariots to meet you? Was it a time to accept money and garments, olive orchards and vineyards, sheep and oxen, male servants and female servants? The thing that perplexes me about this story is somehow Gehazi felt he could get away with this in a secretive way, even though his master is a prophet of God. Now, that doesn't mean that prophets read minds. I want to clarify that. But it means that prophets receive revelation from God, an impartation of knowledge from God. And that is what they go on, right? And so, uh, as an example, uh, previous to the story, we're talking about the Shunammite woman. She had lost her son. So she was coming to Elisha for him to, you know, take care and heal her son. And as she was approaching Elisha, Gehazi stopped her. And Elisha looked at Gehazi and said, okay, let her go. Let her come to me because the Lord has not revealed the reason why she's visiting. So there's some times where God reveals something to a prophet, and there's sometimes he doesn't. It's not like automatic all the time, but it is the knowledge imparted by the Lord. And so in the case of Elisha, God said, let me tell you what Gehazi has been doing behind your back. Why didn't Elisha just walk back with him to Naaman? Why didn't he just walk back to him and say, okay, I want you to tell Naaman what you did. I want you to clear my name. Why didn't he do that? It's because the longer that you get in ministry, the less you begin to care about your reputation. Elisha knew his heart, knew his intent, knew his vow. He wasn't there to make an impression with Naaman or just to say, hey, my reputation might be tarnished here. He was here to do God's work, you know. And I think that, you know, I think a growth for me has been this um, revelation in my own life, you know. Sometimes people say things about me. And in the past, it used to really bother me. But I find the more that I serve the Lord, the less that affects me. Now, sometimes it still stings, don't get me wrong, but there's more of a grief on the other person. You know, there's more of a grief like, oh, Lord, you know, how can I talk to this person how can I help this person? And so that's what I've been finding out for myself. But Elisha was double anointed, right? He was way beyond me. And he has no desire to clear his name before Naaman. 
But God has a desire to punish Gehazi. And this is going to be hard. Hard to read this. Elisha says, therefore, and this is not Elisha's curse, by the way. This is what God has told Elisha to say to Gehazi. Therefore, because, number one, Elisha doesn't have the power to give someone leprosy. All right? Only God does. So he says, therefore, the leprosy of Naaman shall cling to you and to your descendants forever. And he went out from his presence a leper like snow. And if we compare that to what was happening to Naaman, Naaman was a leper, but he left the presence of God with skin like a child. And so the leprosy of Naaman will cling to him. This is hard for us. This is hard for us because... God, that just seems like, like my kid, whenever I, whenever I react to something in a way he doesn't like, he's like, Dad, quit being extra. <laughs> this is extra. This is extra. But, but here's the deal as we try to navigate through this. There's a reason why in the book of James it talks about not all should be teachers because you will be judged more harshly. There's a reason why Miriam and Aaron, when they were like arguing about Moses' leadership, that leprosy happened. You will be judged more harshly. And then secondly, it's like God wants to communicate the importance of disobedience to a person who's double anointed. This was God's spokesperson. Elisha was the spokesperson of God. He was the one that God picked from all the sons of the prophets. He was the one that received the double anointing, the spirit of Elijah. And God takes that seriously, how you treat your leaders. And it's uncomfortable, but this guy tasted the miracles of Elisha. This guy saw the interactions. This guy saw the child being raised from the dead. This person saw a woman whose oil kept producing more oil so that she could live because her husband was killed. It's like, He's seen everything. But he chose to remain selfish and use the prophet's reputation for his gain. So now we just got to close with this whole idea about generational curses. Because I really want to end just communicating this. The Bible does talk about generational curses. And it talks about it in the context of Deuteronomy 5 and Exodus 20. And so if you look at this context here, the issue is idolatry. It says, you shall not bow down to them or serve them, for I, the Lord, your God, am a jealous God. And what does he say? Visiting the fathers of the children to the third and the fourth generations of those who hate me. But showing steadfast love to the thousands of those who love me and keep my commandments. Now, this is in no way a fire and brickstone or whatever they call it, fire and what do they call it? Brimstone, okay, brickstone, you know. This is just an example, really, this passage here is to communicate how much more grace God has than judgment, right? 
Yeah, he judges those from the, uh, you know, the second to the third or fourth, and it, it could be an expression. But it says, he keeps the steadfast love to thousands of those who hold my, my commandments. So, and then when you look at, like, uh, passages like um, Deuteronomy 28, the whole chapter is about blessings and curses. And little, little spoiler alert, the curses are, is a longer section. And so, do we get cursed today? That's a question that we're all pondering and we're thinking about. Does God curse us today? One of the things that you have to know is Jesus. Because it says in Galatians 3, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it was written, Cursed is everyone who is hanged on a tree. And why did Jesus do that? So that in Christ Jesus, the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles, so that we might receive the promised spirit through faith. And so what's being communicated here is that Jesus became a curse for us. And and, and what that means is it's possible in your life Maybe there is some kind of a, a curse that you see occurring. Maybe there, is some, maybe there is something there. But Jesus died for you. And there are things that we have to just sometimes confess and repent of and ask forgiveness for. And every time we do that, every time we do that, it is taken from us. It is gone. It is not, it's eradicated from your life. And so, you know, when I, when I talk to people about this, I, I just try to communicate that there's, there's generational sin and there's generational curses. Generational sin is something that happens just for the fact that Adam was the human representative of us followers of God. And so his sin was passed down. And so no matter what happens, it's passed down to us. Generational curse is something God does, and he does it in the Bible to people who are involved in committing idolatry. But his heart is to bless those. And even, you know, in the the case of Miriam and Aaron, Moses petitioned, And they were healed. And so what I'm saying is, you commit your life to God, you commit your life to Jesus Christ, all you have to do is just confess, confess your sins, confess your habits, and repent. Ask forgiveness. There are so many people that can be serving God to a higher capacity, but their sins, either generational sins from the past involving their family, my family, my, what my mom's side, I believe, is just high in anxiety. I've experienced it with my brothers and pray about that. But the point is, is that there is sin. You know, generational sin that you have to just pray for. So so I just want to end this time by praying. Lord, we all have our sins. We all have sins that we know about. We all have sins we have no idea that we're committing right now. 
And Lord, we just confess them to you, Lord. We just, we lift this up to you. Um, and we repent. And we ask forgiveness. So I'm going to allow you about 30, 20 seconds. If that's you, silently confess, silently repent, and silently ask forgiveness. If you see a stronghold in your life, stronghold of addiction, stronghold of anger and abuse, stronghold of bitterness in your spirit, stronghold of addiction, whether it's sexual, whether it's drugs, whether it's alcohol. If there is something in your life, take time right now in the name of Jesus to confess, repent, and ask forgiveness. I'll give you about 10 seconds. Lord Jesus, you loved us so much, God, that you became a curse for us. You took God's curse that he would put on his people, Lord. And we just thank you for that, Lord. We thank you for that because now we have the spirit that you promised, Lord. And for those that are Christians that are struggling in certain areas, God, I just pray that they recognize that in you, Jesus, curses or generational sins that have been handed down can be completely eradicated and wiped out of their life, Lord. I pray, God, we walk away from this sermon, Lord, not necessarily focusing on just what I said, but just focusing on our own lives. Lord, we want to be released to serve you well. And we just pray that you would be with us, God, and bless us. In Jesus' name, amen. Mm -hmm.